So thank you for um, tuning in again. Uh, as stated on my Patreon, on which you should contribute to if you want to, but uh, I don't want to guilt people about not doing so. I, at this point, have other uh, income sources. Is this with... Yeah, I don't even remember my own. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's without the underscore. Okay. So, um, people asked for my thoughts about the Biden infrastructure plan. Um, now, the infrastructure plan is a $2 trillion um, spending bill with uh, a focus on infrastructure. And I know that there's been a lot of boring trolling regarding what counts as infrastructure, and I'm going to steer clear from that because I mostly just care about the public transportation aspects of it. To some extent, also about the cars, just to know about the difference between cars and uh, public transportation investment. Um, so for example, there's, so this is for example an Amtrak map, that there's a, so there's a breakdown of this, it's just that it's for some reason really hard to find the, um, the exact breakdown of everything. And um, Amtrak, so, uh, so there's the Amtrak bucket and then there's the modernized public transit bit, which is 85 billion. So um, modernized public transit, let's see if there's going to, uh, if there's going to be an exact list. I've seen the exact list. I'm just trying to um, find. The, um, okay, this is what T4A wants. Oh, what is actually happening? Um, okay, so they're not saying where state of good repair is. So, um, there is a prop. So, so this is again. So there's 80 for Amtrak, 85 for. Uh, modernizing public transit, and this is um, out of about 600 for transportation. Um, so, the, so first of all, there's the question of what the public transportation to uh, roads and cars split is. And uh, the split appears to be about one to two. So about one third um, of the actual physical infrastructure that's going to be built on transportation um, appears to be going to public transportation and the rest is going to go to uh, cars um, and the auto parts are a combination of fix it first so this means repairing roads um, and uh, um, and investments in electric vehicle infrastructure. So that would be uh, things like um, a national network of charging stations um, in lieu of uh, gas stations uh, for, uh, um, for fuel power cars. Um, and, and in fact, the, the idea of a charging station is not a new idea. Um, I read that uh, in the very early 1900s, Thomas Edison, uh, predicted that there would be a national network of charging stations for electric cars. At the time, uh, cars could be powered by uh, electricity, by uh, gas, or I think also there were some steam-powered cars. Um, and uh, and it was and I and I think it wasn't until the Model T that gas-powered cars uh, beat the electric cars resoundingly. Um, the issue was, uh, first of all, the electric cars at the time were less reliable, but also there was, um, but there was a lot of range anxiety. The range of the batteries was very uh, restricted, whereas um, on a uh, tank of gas you could drive farther. And yes, there were, uh, there still had to be gas stations. Uh, I think the first one opened in New York in 1901. Um, but you could but you could drive longer between gas stations uh, than you could than you could between charging stations. Um, of note, this problem exists today. There is still such a thing as range anxiety. Only in the last few years has it begun to be alleviated through batteries that are good enough that you still have a lot less range than on a tank of gas if you have a fuel efficient car. But st but it's long enough for your normal needs. So um, the target has been uh, 
a uh, daily commute from the suburbs to the city and back and maybe some errands and then you would charge overnight. Um, so that is why electric cars today are starting to gain market share. Um, but, um, but, but, um, but for intercity driving there's still a problem. Um, you're not, um, you, you don't have batteries right now to, for example, drive between Los Angeles and San Francisco. So, the, so that's where the idea of charging stations or maybe battery swap uh, comes from. So there's the Tesla program, but it's a program that tries to vendor lock you into a Tesla. Um, and instead you have uh, plans that uh, build public uh, or maybe franchise that are um, open to all uh, makes of cars. Uh, charging stations. So, for example, uh, France has been doing this. So, actually, um, people like to mock Emmanuel Macron uh, over everything, and it literally means everything. But um, he was uh, long before the Gilets Jaunes started to throw rocks. He was actually proposing, not just proposing, spending money on first of all on uh, additional mass transit. So, um, on certain, for example, expansions of the. Paris Metro, um, of uh, Metro and Light Rail networks um, in, sec in the secondary cities of France, and, uh, but also on electric vehicle infrastructure. So that would be, a, so I'm forgetting the exact number that he was uh, planning to do, so that, but that is uh, an under construction uh, national uh, charging station network for France. Uh, which did not deter the, the rock throwers, the Gilets Jaunes uh, kept mocking everyone as, oh, we're too, we're too poor to afford a Tesla, we're not going to live in the city and take the train, that's, that, that's kind of the mentality. Um, so, so my point is that it's something that is... Act oh, uh, okay, so are you asking about um, electric cars being heavier? I have no clue. Um, I genuinely don't know. Um, I can see why batteries would need to be heavier than a gas tank, but I mean the gas tank. I mean a car that weighs a ton has um, a fuel capacity of let's say fifty liters. Fifty liters of fuel is less than fifty kilograms, so I don't know. Um, so anyway, that's the part for electric cars. I'm not going, um, and, but but I will also note that most of the spending in the road bucket is not on electric cars. I can actually, I actually kind of want to Google it right now. Um, Biden infrastructure plan, not Amtrak, but uh, EV charging stations. I do not remember what number. Okay, um, okay so he's promising 500,000 charging stations according to the first result from Google. Uh, oh, that's from Bloomberg. CNBC. Uh, okay, so it's proposing 174 for electric cars, which is not going to be mostly charging stations. It's also things like um, subsidies for um, the per for the purchase of electric cars, and you might note that this is comparable to the entire spending on public transportation. Uh, and right now, public transportation usage, even in America, is higher than electric car usage. Electric cars, um, I do not remember what proportion of the market they are, um, what proportion of the, even of the market for new cars, but the proportion of public transportation is 5% uh, in commuting, and it's more than 5% in the expensive commuting. So um, public transportation is uh, much higher capacity, so people tend to take it on the most congested um, links. So you take it when you work in city center. You take it when you work at rush hour. I can actually show you if you want from the hub out report, New York, um, how um, the model split for people entering um, the Manhattan core um, is, uh, there's a large majority for public transit at all, in all time, at, at all times of day, but during uh, rush hour, it's especially acute, and during rush hour, there's the, the model split for public transit is even higher than for cars, and this is also why um, I worry about certain reformers who took their who, who take their actually good proposals to improve off-peak public transportation 
uh, to the direction of saying that, oh, um, is the end of rush hour means retooling transit. No, the end of rush hour and the end of city center is pretty much in public transit. Um, I mean, yes, for example, you do have things like all day clock phase schedules in Germany and in Switzerland, but still the model split is higher at rush hour than not at rush hour. It's certainly higher for um, when you're driving into a congested city center than you're, when you're traveling between two suburbs. Um, so, so, my point, so, the, so the point of this is that public transportation is 5% of commutes, but it is much more than 5% of commutes on which you spend money because when you widen a road, you don't widen a road for the purposes of people who commute to work between, let's say, noon and nine in the evening. Okay, the sort of, so, so I know, for example, um, tech workers uh, in Boston, um, where the hours are even more shifted than on the West Coast, um, and yeah, some of them get to work at 11 in the morning or noon, and then, yeah, they work an eight-hour day. That's how they work. Um, and the ones among them who drive, um, yes, maybe they consume a parking resource, but they don't genuinely consume a road resource, right? Because the roads are sized for rush hour. The roads are sized for the plurality of commuters who get to work not at 11 or noon, but at 9. Um, so, in effect, um, people who drive off-peak are free for the system, just as people who ride public transportation off-peak are not just free, they're good for the system, because um, for public transportation there's the point of uh, frequency. So if um, uh, you're running a train every three minutes rush hour and every 10 minutes off-peak, then the person who rides off-peak, uh, kind of on the margin, will make you maybe increase your frequency from every 10 minutes to every eight minutes. Um, so the trains are still going to be at a, a level of fullness that um, pays for marginal operating costs, perhaps. But more importantly, the frequency is going to get better, so it's going to get better for other people. Now, for cars, it doesn't get better um, because the best road is the road in which you're the only car, but it does not make things worse if you're so far below capacity. Um, so, so my point is that among the commutes that require spending, so these are rush hour commutes to areas that are congested, um, the share of public transportation, even in the United States, is much higher than 5%. I'm not going to say how high it is, because I do not know. Um, I could look at when people get to work, um, um, in the, the table, uh, means of transportation to work, by selected characteristics of um, the Census Bureau. I'm not going to do that, because there's also the question of do you work in the city or in the suburbs, and that um, is not very easy. Uh, to intersect with that. You can, uh, you can look at specific workplace geographies like Manhattan, Boston, Washington, D.C., but it's not going to be as granular as I would like it to be, so I'm just going to say much higher than 5% and leave it at that. Um, so my point is that um, public transportation, I mean, public transportation also gets more than 5% of transportation money in the United States. The normal split is 80-20, and right now the split has changed to about 2 to 1, or maybe 2 and a half to 1. Um, so it's, it's a better split. Um, it's, it's very clear, I think, that um, Secretary Buttigieg would prefer to steer American transportation policy in a direction that is more um, pro-public transportation. Um, moreover, um, and so as I said, public transportation lives off of rush hour. Now, separately, um, knowing um, the sort of transit reformers that he is um, channeling, he, I think he also wants to shift the direction of public transportation toward better off-peak service. So remember, two things are necessary. You need um, a strong city center, um, and ideally uh, not, not completely, um, I don't know if you say isotropic in time and not space, but let's pretend and completely isotropic um, trip, uh, trip times, but um, uh, but you do want, so, so on the one hand you need that, but on the other hand you do need to invest in better public transportation for the off-peak, but using things like, um, uh, like, like um, intermodal integration, um, avoiding segmenting the market, because when you're uh, fighting for frequency, you don't want to split the frequencies between, um, let's say, a bus market for the poor and a rail market for the rich. And 
again, judging by the fact that they've moved in, um, the bill from a 4 to 1 split to something like a 2 to 1, they're going in that direction. So I, so I don't want to slag on the bill too much. Um, and this is a bill that I'm, to be frank, a lot less excited about than I was, let's say, a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, so I do want to praise the movement in the right direction on the split, but I will note that in Germany the split is 55% cars, 42% rail, 3% canals. Um, I may be off by a few percent, but if I'm, but I'm not going to be off to the point that it's not 55, 42, but even 50, 50. I mean, it's more cars than, uh, uh, than rail, by approximately that extent. Um, and uh, this is um, a consequence of our right-wing government. So, as you may be aware, Germany has a grand coalition. In fact, 12 out of the last 16 years, we have had a grand coalition led by the Christian Democrats, with the Social Democrats as junior partner. However, the Ministry of Transportation has always been uh, controlled by the right. Um, and I'm going to see if there's a li okay, list of German transport ministers. Um, so, um, okay, this is Nazi era, so let's not talk about the Nazi minister of transport. I know nothing about what they did. I mean, I know the... Um, I, I, I know about the Autobahn, but beyond that, I don't know. So look at how. So in the first, so the first time, yes, it was a social democrat, but in the subsequent three um, administrations, it's well, it's not just the right. It's not it's not CDU. It's CSU. So it's more right wing people. They um, are pro car. Um, I may have mentioned this at past um, in past streams. Andreas Scheuer. Um, is possibly the most right-wing member of the cabinet. He um, assembled a uh, group of doctors who were also right-wing to sign a um, to, to sign a petition require um, not requiring a petition asking the EU to relax pollution controls on the grounds that uh, pollution controls didn't help public health and they just raised costs for the car industry. Um, Bavaria, you may be aware, is uh, one of the one of our big car producing regions. So it's Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg. Um, so maybe in the United States you think of wealth as tech because that's what powers San Francisco, or maybe finance because of New York. But here, um, let's not sell short the finance of Frankfurt. However, um, the wealthiest part of the wealthiest metropolitan region in Germany, Munich, is not a financial region. It is a manufacturing region for. Um, General manufacturing, Siemens is headquartered there, but also uh, cars and trucks. Uh, BMW stands for uh, Bavarian Motor Works. Um, and uh, likewise, the MAN uh, trucks are headquartered there. So, uh, so the Bavarians are very pro-car. Um, they also think that environmentalism is dumb, so they enjoy um, hippie punching. But, um, in, but in addition to all of that, uh, that's their home industry. So imagine that Michigan. Imagine that Michigan. If, if you're American, imagine that Michigan um, had kind of the economy of Michigan today, but had but was as rich as California, um, and voted like um, not even Texas. Let's say voted like Tennessee or Alabama. So that is Bavaria, and these people have been running. Um, the Ministry of Transport for almost 12 years. Uh, they favor cars, so we spend more on cars than on public transportation. Um, the Deutschland Takt uh, has to be done bottom up with, um, through a rather hostile ministry and through um, civil servants who are uh, used to working with a pro car ministry. Um, uh, so I, I've heard from some activists in Germany actually that um, 12 years of CSU domination. Uh, mean that um, the civil servants who get promoted are the ones who are best at building roads, not trains. So at this point, even the apolitical civil service um, in, in Germany is kind of an obstacle for public transport. Um, so, so, so I bring this up because with a, an, an incredibly right-wing transport ministry, um, our split is 55-42. The American split looks like about 70-30 or 67-33. Um, so um, so, so, you, so you do notice that they are trying to left-wing eyes, let's call it the uh, car bucket. So 
they're spending not 80 20 but again about 67 33 or 70 30 but they're kind of selectively being more left-wing with the car bucket um, and, and again I'm talking about the car at this point because it's more than the transit bucket I will go to I will get to the transit bucket soon but the car bucket um, so you see so much of this 174 billion is about electric vehicles. So you have consumer rebates because the United States believes that uh, personal consumption is the strength uh, of its economy. This is what, so it, it gets to the point that after 9-11, um, George W. Bush told Americans to go shopping to help the economy. In Germany, that's unthinkable. Uh, in Northern Europe in general, it's unthinkable. We have export-oriented economies. The idea is that you should always produce, produce, produce. Um, consumption is used as even a little bit immoral. Um, and uh, then you have the charging stations um, and uh, more for electric school buses and something called zero emission transit vehicles. Um, now zero emission transit vehicles is transit spending, but I don't think it is good transit spending. So I'd like to, to explain this a little bit um, because this, this is already where we're getting to public transit. Um, 25 billion for zero emission transit vehicles. Um, so how does a bus not emit? Um, and what do I say emit? Um, it's pollution and greenhouse gases. Uh, well, it's powered not by fuel, but by electricity. But then there's the question of how does the electricity get to the bus? And this is where you have essentially two technologies. The first one is the trolleybus. Um, now, this is a technology that um, is about 100 years old um, and, is a, uh, and is kind of descended from the streetcar. Um, so it's just a normal bus. It looks like a bus. Um, when, you when, when you ride on it, it has the ride quality of a bus. So it's much more swayy, for example. The, uh, uh, you feel the road that you ride on. It's uh, transmitted through the rubber tires. Um, I commuted um, on, a, on a bus in Vancouver for two years and it was either diesel or uh, trolley. The diesel is actually faster in Vancouver because in Vancouver uh, the way they set things up on the main bus corridors is that the locals are trolleys and then the, exp and then the limited stop buses are diesels so that they wouldn't have to overtake um, on, the, uh, on the wire. Um, but but it's not it's not inherently faster than a diesel. It's not inherently faster to run by diesel than by trolley. It's just how Vancouver set things up. Um, but I could ride either, so I can tell you about the ride quality. Um, the so the trolley buses are less noisy, which is nice. But it's the same ride quality of a bus. There are sudden stops, you get thrown forward. Um, and and I have a friend with um, uh, I have a friend with um, a chronic pain syndrome, which is called Ehlers Danlos. Uh, and Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Um, Ehler, yeah, this. Um, and uh, this, is, so this is uh, a type of hypermobility thing that makes your dis that makes your joints a little bit more flexible, but also uh, weaker. Um, if you play D and D, think of it as a bonus to ducks and a penalty to con. Um, and, and my point is that this. This means that you get very easily fatigued. Um, and said friend, um, when they commuted by a trolley bus um, in the suburb, in, in the parts of the Boston area that are on a trolley bus, so that would be Watertown and Delbont. There's a trolley bus that feeds Harvard Square um, for a connection to the subway. The ride quality on the trolley bus was not good, and they were in pain whenever they rode, um, and that limited their ability to get around. Um, so this is still a bus. Um, However, it is a bus that, first of all, has no local emissions um, because it's electric. Uh, it's a bus that, because it does not have to carry its own power plant, uh, has much better performance specs in the same way that when you electrify a train, you have much better performance specs than if it's diesel. Um, so usually when you see trolley bus networks, um, it's either because it w it's in a country with really cheap electricity. For example, in Switzerland, they have cheap hydropower. Um, and, uh, and, and, also, uh, and, and also it could be hills. Now, I do not know how hilly Zurich is. Um, 
but for example, San Francisco. San Francisco has the biggest trolleybus network in uh, North America. Uh, the heliness of San Francisco um, is rather legendary. Um, so this is why it's trolleys. And, and likewise, uh, Vancouver. Um, in Vancouver, I think it's more because, the, uh, because of cheap hydropower. Uh, BC Hydro uh, used to also run the streetcars. Um, but, there's, but, but Vancouver is not flat. Um, there are hills there, I just don't think they're as steep as in San Francisco. Um, Seattle, also very hilly and cheap hydropower. Um, so, so, so you do this because um, you just have much better performance bucks. Uh, in fact, the trolley bus is the best sing is, is the single best public transport vehicle that exists if you want to climb hills because it is a bus. Um, buses have rubber tires. Rubber tires have higher friction, so it's easier to climb uh, hills with them. This is also something that you get with rubber tire nutrams. Um, and it's powered by electricity delivered from wires. This means that it has the best of both worlds if all you care about is climbing uh, a hill. Um, there, again, there are other goals, for example, good ride comfort, which a trolley bus does not provide. Uh, capacity, which a trolley bus prov um, could provide if you make it longer, but a streetcar would do it better. Um, low uh, costs. Now, trolley buses are not very good for that, unfortunately. Diesel buses are more flexible. Uh, you don't need to build the wires. Now, I do. Now, I mentioned the provenance of trolley bus coming from streetcars because in American law, the trolley bus is viewed as fixed infrastructure. Um, now, I'm not going to put a link because I I know that I uh, found the link. I think in the I think uh, I. I uh, wrote this article once with, with links about the problems of uh, about the problems of um, electric uh, of, of, of battery electric buses and, and it was connect and it was linking to what California was doing. Um, the trolley bus is considered fixed infrastructure because you need to build wires for it. Now the cost of the wires is approximately a million ish dollars per kilometer. Um, when they're being extended in Switzerland. It's not common to extend wire, but when it is done, this is roughly the Swiss cost. Now, of course, Swiss costs are extremely low for things in general, but um, um, but, but that is the cost. And um, the, so, so in American, uh, so, so when, when you divvy up uh, buckets in, in America for, for transportation between fixed infrastructure and a bus, trolley buses go alongside um, light rail and subways as fixed infrastructure and not with a bus. So when they ask for, so when they talk about $25 billion for zero emission transit vehicles, um, I'm fairly certain this is not trolley buses. Now, again, trolley buses are not being built very commonly because um, there is something called in motion charging. Um, let's, yeah, okay, so they do mention in motion charging, but only one. So what is in motion charging? So in motion charging is when you have a battery electric bus that can also run under wire. Um, so let me see if I can find the, okay, so this is, so I, I saw this before when I, uh, so Ivico will sell you this, uh, um, Keepa will, will sell you this. So these are buses that can run under trolley, but um, have enough battery for off-wire capability. Um, and the question is always how big the off-wire capability is. I mean, how big the battery is. And um, right now, and um, uh, let me see if they say it anywhere in their, uh, um, in anywhere in their, uh, on their website. But, um, but, but I can tell you, but I can just tell you from factories that I read. Um, in motion charging, um, the current state of the technology, and when I say current, I mean as of about two years ago, um, lets you have about 10 kilometers of off-wire capability on the bus, um, and I think maybe half the route needs to be wired. Um, so, for example, uh, if the route is 10 kilometers long, five are wired, five are not wired, you take the five that are wired, then you have a 10 kilometer round trip, um, on the five kilometers that are unwired, and then you go back and recharge on the five kilometers that are wired. Um, this is uh, so because I'm involved with uh, Boston, 
um, I'm especially interested in this because um, you do in motion charging, um, you do it especially when you can wire one segment and then branch off to many others. Uh, it's kind of like a Stadtbahn or a subway surface trolley. You put the trunk in the subway and then branch on the surface. So it's the same with uh, so, so it's the same with in motion charging. Uh, and again, I do not think that it is being subsidized in this bill. Um, I, I do not know for a fact that it isn't, but when they talk about zero emissions vehicles, they always mean pure battery electrics. Uh, in fact, many of the players in the industry, I think Proterra, um, at one point said outright trolley buses are obsolete. Um, they're not obsolete in here. Thank you very much. Uh, but um, but for example, but for example, it would be a really good choice. Maybe not if you build, run buses on a grid like Chicago. Um, or Los Angeles, but Boston has no grid. So if you run, so, so you have this really busy bus corridor on uh, Washington Street where they used to have an elevated line, and then they removed the elevated line and moved it um, to um, richer and whiter neighborhoods, um, and gave the and gave Roxbury um, um, bus lanes on the idea that BRT is as good as a subway. So what you could do is do in motion charging on Washington Street. Um, and then you, and then the buses would branch, or maybe go a little bit farther out for uh, further branching. So you have, so you have the Silver Line, which just goes in Washington, and then you have um, routes that um, partly use uh, Washington, maybe part part of Washington, maybe to get to Ruggles here. Um, the some of the busiest buses in Boston so there would be things like the Twenty Eight, which just goes on Blue Hill Ave, um, and you might say, wait, there's a commuter rail line very close to it, yes there is, but they think that commuter rail is only for rich people um, and they don't really try to um, help serve um, low income Dorchester with commuter rail. Um, and like we have the 23, which I think goes like this to Ashmont. Um, so you could wire a central segment and then branch out um, in battery mode. Um, this is a solid technology, it is being used um, in, for example, uh, Switzerland, um, and I've seen in uh, Austria, uh, Germany, and I, and I bring these countries up because the climate in these countries um, is similar to that of Boston. The summers are cooler, but the winters are probably comparably harsh. This is important because batteries are terrible in harsh winters. This is the problem with battery electric buses. Um, I've heard horror stories from an agency called MVTA, um, I think it's Minnesota Valley Transit Administration. This is a, it's not the transit agency that runs in in Minneapolis itself. It runs in, um, I believe, the white flight suburbs south of Minneapolis. These are wealthier people who uh, commute to city center, and they might ride the bus if you offer them a, a decent bus. Um, and uh, the bus. Uh, and the battery electric bus works really well, especially in traffic, uh, in the same way that uh, hybrids have better uh, fuel economy in the city than on the highway um, through um, regenerative braking. But um, then um, came a harsh winter, and specifically harsh uh, winter. Um, it, at one point, the battery, I, I think the battery didn't even last a full round trip um, because of the heating requirements. And, uh, and as a result, they gave it up. Uh, they they give uh, they give back the um, Proterra uh, BBs. Likewise, in Worcester, in in Worcester, I think they were Proterra, but I'm not sure. In Worcester, um, the buses shut down in a blizzard, but because the but because the Worcester um, RTA um, serves a low income clientele, they just didn't care, and they kept using these buses with the understanding that yeah, on a bad winter day, you will not be able to get to work, but it's poor people who cares. Um, whereas MVTA is, again, a more um, suburban middle class agency, so they do care. Um, and my point is that BEBs as a technology don't seem ready for prime time yet. Maybe they will be in a couple of years. Maybe the spending will stimulate research. I don't know. But right now, they are still in growing pains, the technology. Um, the one place I know that went full BEBs and is happy is Shenzhen. Um, so let's look for a sec at Shenzhen's uh, climate and ask ourselves um, what difference might there be in climate between uh, a city where the average low temperature in January is 12 and a half 
um, in a city like, let's say, Worcester, Massachusetts, where, uh, let's see if there's, a, what's the uh, history, geography, climate, when the average, a city where the average uh, high temperature in January is below zero. So, Shenzhen, average uh, in January is 15.4. Worcester averages negative 8.4. Um, so, in Shenzhen, they're also using BYD and not Proterra, but I don't think BYD is any better at this than Proterra. Um, Albuquerque had big problems with um, BYD. Um, so, my point is that there's this 25 uh, billion for zero emission transit vehicles, but at least so far, these are questionable vehicles. Um, they could improve in the future, um, but so far they're not good enough. And I know that in Moscow, actually, they had to uh, replace, tro they, in, in Moscow they replaced trolley buses with BEBs, and they had to replace each trolley bus with, I believe, two BEBs um, because of poor reliability. Um, in Boston, likewise, they are looking at the zero emission transit vehicles, not to uh, replace the diesels, but to replace the trolleys. For some reason, they don't like the trolleys. Part of it is that there are not a lot of them, so the maintenance is more difficult, but there's also this kind of, I think there's also this weird shutness type quality to, uh, um, to a trolley bus, um, and this leads to kind of a bias against it, in, um, at least in the United States. Um, so, so the 25 billion, and it could be good if it could be spent on IMC, but I don't think it's being spent on IMC. I think they're planning on just BEBs, which, uh, which is not good. Um, by the way, yes. Um, so yes, IMC is also good for diversions if the regular route is blocked, but you don't need full IMC for that. Um, in fact, a lot of American trolleys at this point are sold with like one kilometer of off-air range. I think that is what is happening in Seattle, specifically for this. Um, now, were Vancouver to do that, it would also be able to run the limited stop buses on routes like 4th Avenue, um, Broadway, um, and Hastings. It could do so with trolleys, and then they would just uh, go off wire um, to go around a local bus. Um, so that would be really good for Vancouver, but they're not doing so, unfortunately. Um, um, so yes, there, this, this 25 billion could do a lot of good, but in, but in the way I am understanding how uh, these buckets are divvied up, when they say um, zero emission transit vehicles, it's never thought of as trolley buses, because trolley buses are viewed as the rail bucket. Um, and... Uh, um, and, and this is really sad because IMC, again, is something that is not exactly fixed infrastructure. You need to build a little bit of fixed infrastructure, but it's something that there's a lot of pushing and, um, and, and transit matters. So I'm not involved in the Better Bus Project for Transit Matters, which is pushing for uh, IMC. Um, I know people who are because we're all one Transit Matters. I know that Jay Flynn has been working a lot on this. I, I, we're working together also on Regional Rail. But, um, but I know that in Transit Matters, um, there's, a lot, there's a big push to do some IMC. I, do, um, I believe Washington Street, again, in, in Boston is one of the uh, projects that um, are being prioritized. But I do not know. I, I, don't, know the, I don't have the full list. Or I've, I, I've never seen a map, for example, of what routes IMC should, uh, should cover. Um, so, uh, so this is just uh, me remembering that we talked when we launch a project about Washington is uh, one good corridor for this, just because um, j uh, just because it branches so much, just because the levels of pollution in Dorchester are very high. Um, this is one of the worst parts of Boston for asthma, the Dorchester area. Um, again, so this is one of the poorest neighborhoods of Boston. Um, like the poor people in Boston live in Roxbury, which is around here. They live in Dorchester, which is the biggest neighborhood in the city. It's roughly all of this, and then Mattapan, which is this. Um, also, uh, East Boston, so here. Um, rich people live um, right near city center. Um, Back Bay, of course, is very wealthy. Alston Brighton is rather middle class. JP, uh, Jamaica Plain, is rather middle class. Um, uh, and then uh, in suburbs that uh, have such a long history of uh, middle class and upper middle class urbanization that they uh, rejected annexation early, Brookline did so in uh, the late 19th century already. 
Um, and likewise, Cambridge. C Cambridge was never going to get annexed. It has a, it, it was it it is not it did not form as a suburb the way Brooklyn did. But Cambridge is also um, a very wealthy uh, city in the, in the Boston area. Um, and so, so the pollution levels are really high here, and this is one of the priorities uh, for IMC as a result. Um, and again, it has to be IMC and not pure BEBs, because pure BEBs are unreliable. People in a neighborhood like Dorchester um, are facing zero tolerance. So when you do shift work, so you would expect that the most zero tolerance kind of jobs for lateness would be the most safety critical ones. You cannot be late to work if you are a surgeon, right? Because the surgery is going to be late and the patient is going to die. However, precisely because it is safety critical, they use a lot of checks to make sure that the doctor is just never going to be late. So maybe the doctor has to report to work um, early. Uh, maybe uh, there's a shift, uh, there, there's a shifting issue. So if for some reason the doctor is late, um, another doctor is just going to, the, the previous shift doctor is just going to keep overworking um, for maybe 20 minutes longer. Um, so, so because it's so safety critical, they make sure it just never happens. Um, now, if you're a shift worker at McDonald's, um, you're also going to face zero tolerance. Um, it's not going to be safety critical, but if you work, a, but if you're a shift worker at McDonald's, you're not treated as an important person. You know this because you're getting paid a very low wage. Um, you know that, uh, that your manager does not treat you as a valued person. I, I mean, maybe you're told that you're important to the team, but you know that like you're very easily replaceable. So um, the so so because the workers are treated as interchangeable, they are, they face zero tolerance, and this means that. Um, they actually have much longer commutes as a result because they, if you absolutely can't be late and your commute choices are a bus that gets stuck in traffic um, or a train that comes every 45 minutes, um, you're going to take like a 30 minute, um, like a 30 minute cushion. I mean, when I was teaching at UBC and I was commuting, um, I could not be late, right? I mean, if I'm late, then my students don't get class or they get a shorter class. Um, so um, with the level of reliability of buses in Vancouver, um, I would show up uh, with about 20 minutes to spare and that was because, and, and I would have cut it closer, but, um, but I couldn't because the bus that just makes class is gonna be full um, with students who boarded um, farther from the uni than I did. Um, so I took a 20 minute cushion and uh, this was with uh, very little uh, traffic. So with a lot of traffic, yeah, 30, 40 minute cushions. Um, so, so essentially a lot of the problems of poor commutes would be addressed with better reliability and BEBs would hurt that. Remember, BEBs are not reliable in winter. They're also not reliable in especially hot summers that basically only exist in places like Phoenix. Um, they don't exist in Boston, they don't exist in Shenzhen. Um, but, um, but, but the problem here is uh, winter. So you want to make sure that you have IMC and not BEBs. Um, and, uh, and I wish that uh, there were an amendment to the infrastructure plan that uh, focused um, on this, that said um, zero emission vehicles are awesome, let's make sure they are reliable, let's get IMC buses um, wherever they are appropriate in America. Again, this is not everywhere. Chicago, again, is not very good geography for IMC. Um, New York, ironically, might be. New York is not a, a very um, a branched bus geography. Um, the Brooklyn bus redesign, um, this is going to be the ugly version of the Brooklyn bus redesign. There are prettier versions. Um, you see, it's a grid. Um, but it's a, first of all, it's an incredibly strong grid. You actually could plausibly just wire most of the system. Second, um, you could do um, something called opportunity charging. Um, this is something that they do for uh, BEPs. There's something called op charging that you uh, uh, do usually at terminals and that forces the bus to wait a little bit. Um, so that is an extra cost. Um, and usually it also requires a facility. So the facility costs extra. Um, so this is a, something that is not appropriate for smaller cities. Um, they tried to do it in Albuquerque and realized it was just going to cost too much to build the facility. But in New York, 
you plausibly could build the facility because the bus uh, ridership density is so high that you could plausibly do so, especially when um, you have um, one place where a, bus of, where a bunch of buses converge. In this case, it would be East New York, for example. Um, um, and East New York is also a, a giant bus uh, depot. Um, these are all diesel buses. They contribute to poor air quality uh, right around the depot. Um, and as you can imagine, these depots tend to be sited in uh, poor neighborhoods. Um, so, uh, so this would do a lot for the air quality of uh, East New York. And we didn't do a Manhattan redesign, um, only Brooklyn, but in Manhattan there's a similar problem with bus depots in Harlem. Um, but again, this is something that you probably want IMC and not Pure BB. Um, so, again, so again, they should subsidize BEBs um, where appropriate, but BEBs, again, they're not yet ready for prime time. It's much more appropriate, I think. It's, much more, it's, a, it's a solved problem to do INC at this point. This is the advantage of imitating rather than innovating. The innovation was already done by companies like Keeper, by companies like Ivaco. Um, congratulations, you can just import their technology um, and, uh, and, and, then, um, and then have reliable um, zero emission buses, but that, but um, but first of all, again, they're not appropriate one hundred percent of the time. Um, but they, but but they are appropriate in quite a in, in quite a lot of America and quite in quite a lot of places that um, buy buses. Um, so so that would be something that uh, is th that uh, that I wish that they did in the um, okay. And now so so anyway, this is the road bucket, which again includes 25 billion for public transit. This is why I'm not saying it's 75, 25 or something. This is why I'm saying it's more like 70, 30 or 67, 33, because this is actually transit spending, even though it's technically in a different bucket from the modernized public transit. Um, the problem is that the, the modernized public transit, and um, I'm going to look for this again, Biden infrastructure plan, modernized public transit. Let me see if I can find the exact breakdown. Um, um, uh, so, let's see. Um, wait, where is Um, so they're not saying this, but I know that there's a big part, a big chunk of the 85, um, is going to go for something called state of good repair. Um, state of good repair is a terrible thing. Now, the idea of being in state of good repair is very good. Don't get me wrong. But I want to go into the history of state of good repair. Let, let me check again because the number that's stuck in my head for how much it, uh, is, is 55 out of the 85, and I know it's wrong because I know it's not the majority, so, um, why can I not find this? I mean, I've seen this on Twitter. Um, I've seen this on Twitter, I've seen... Oh, it is 55, okay, yeah. So the 85 is being spent Oh, okay, it's actually that bad. 55 for state of good repair and only 25, uh, and only I should say 30 to expansion because ADA, 100% expansion. People have this idea that you have expand transit systems and helping implement ADA, uh, helping implement ADA is two different things. These are not two different things. Accessibility is expansion. Expansion is every kind of um, investment that improves service over the baseline. If the improvement is you built a new subway line, that's expansion. Second Avenue subway is an expansion. If the improvement is um, you uh, did something to reduce your operating expenses in the future, for example, you, built, you automate the trains, that is expansion. When Paris went from, when Paris is making metro lines driverless, that is an expansion. Um, likewise, when you uh, improve the infrastructure so that it would be easier to maintain, um, like Chicago did in, uh, uh, in the last generation or so, that is expansion, even though if you look at lines on a map, it doesn't look like Chicago has changed. Um, 
when you um, increase frequency through better signaling, which in Paris is also bundled with automation, that is expansion, okay? I mean, it's not just pretty lines on a map, but in New York City, um, the busiest subway lines run every two and a half minutes. Um, and in London, they run every minute 40, and in Paris, they run every minute 25. Um, so if New York were capable of getting from, let's say, 2 minutes 30 to about a minute 30, um, that would, the extra, uh, and, and let's say it's on a four-track line, like the Lexington line, the extra capacity you're getting from that is more than the capacity that you're getting out of an entirely new two-track line. So this is absolutely expansion. Um, again, higher, uh, higher throughput, lower operating costs, uh, easier maintainability, physical expansion of lines on the map, higher speed. Um, if you speed up the trains, that is, an expan that is expansion. Um, if you remove slow zones, that's expansion. Um, so these are things that um, th 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 these are things you invest money in to make things better in the future, and this includes accessibility. In the same way that it's understood that it's considered an expansion project if you build an intermodal transfer facility, um, this is not necessarily being done today, uh, but it used to be, and there are examples in Toronto and in Boston where they uh, would build underground uh, bus loops at subway stations to facilitate transfers. So um, um, this still exists at Harvard. Um, there's a bunch of buses that terminate underground at Harvard, um, and, and I don't know if you can very easily see the um, the portal. This is the portal. Um, um, this is not a freeway tunnel. This is a bus tunnel that makes the buses dump passengers much closer to the train. Uh, the, um, so, if there were no such um, facility and it were built, that would be expansion. It would under be understood as expansion that improves intermodal access. And this is the same when you make a station wheelchair accessible. Elevators are expansion. Um, the problem is, 55 billion for state of good repair is not expansion. Um, and now, I want to go over the history of state of good repair. Um, okay, I need to, okay, I'm, let's see, let me see if I can ban the spammer. Um, why can I not ban, uh, okay. All right, so the, uh, so, state of good repair, the history is as follows. In the early 20th century, maybe even the late 19th century, it is expected that public transportation be profitable. Um, and I'm going to give the American history, but um, there are parallels of this in, uh, in Europe. Now, this does not mean that public transportation is done privately. It sometimes is. In Chicago, I believe the L was built um, privately from the beginning, and even the Loop was built privately. Um, in New York, the Ls were built privately. In London, the Tube was built privately. Uh, in fact, the three of the tube lines, um, the later ones from the, the ones that are um, 20th, not 19th century, these are the Piccadilly line. Um, so, so the Piccadilly line is the one that goes um, well, on the Piccadilly, so it's this one. Um, it's a dark blue one. Then there's uh, the Bakerloo line, which, you, which, which for many generations was the most crowded until they built a relief line. Um, no, that's the Jubilee line, that's a relief line for the Bakerloo, so this is the real Bakerloo. So the Bakerloo is northwest to southeast. Um, so this is the Bakerloo, um, because this is, because it connects Baker Street in the northwest of central London with Waterloo, so Bakerloo. And finally, the Charing Cross half of the Charing Cross um, trunk of the Northern Line, so it's this one. So these were actually um, all, uh, the, the franchises were taken over by the same person uh, that built the Chicago Loop, Charles Yerkes, Yerkes, I don't know how to pronounce his last name.
um, this, so this guy. Um, so, uh, oh, it's uh, Yerkes. So yeah, so he built uh, the Chicago uh, Loop, uh, I believe. And uh, the, um, and then subsequently also invested in uh, the, um, in the franchise as it became, uh, uh, that, that became these three lines, Baker, Lou, Piccadilly, and Charing Cross. Um, although, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, he died shortly before. Um, so again, this is, this is all private. Now, in Berlin, this was done publicly. In Berlin, the, uh, so first of all, the railways were public, were, were, were nationalized by Prussia. Um, but also the U-Bahn, which was separate from the railways, was built publicly by the city. Um, in fact, they rejected a private sector proposal because they believed that the public sector should do it. Um, and then a generation later, the public sector actually built that line. That's USX. In New York, it was hybrid. Um, it was run by the private sector, but it was built with public money. Um, so it kind of was an early example of PPP. Um, and, but, but all of these were supposed to be operationally profitable. So public money was about, or, or investor money was about construction. For operations, that's one out of ticket fares. You're not going to discuss how you're going to subsidize something when it does not need subsidies. It's like asking um, how you're going to operationally support a supermarket, how you're going to operationally support an oil oil, how you're going to operationally support a farm, how you're going to operationally support an auto factory, how you're going to operationally support a tech firm. All of these are supposed to be profitable. If they're not profitable, something's gone deeply wrong. Um, so, um, so the discussion was purely about expansion. Um, like was with roads, um, people were thinking only about expansion, not maintenance. So the lockbox bills that were passed in the 1910s um, by referendum, thanks to uh, angry um, upper middle class drivers, um, the uh, required all fuel tax money um, and car license fees and similar things that were viewed as user fees to be spent on roads. This was only for road construction. Um, and uh, so maintenance, there, there was maintenance, don't, don't get me wrong, but it was not viewed as, um, it was not viewed as a priority. Now, um, maintenance, because it's long term, is e really easy to skimp on, okay? If you cut straight operating money, people will notice that, the, that there are fewer trains. If you do, if you under maintain, people will take longer to notice. And as a result, as public transportation became unprofitable, um, it was really easy to skimp, leading to poor maintenance. This um, became acute in New York City in the 1970s when the, um, when the level of under-maintenance had reached such a point that large fractions of the system, I never remember the proportion, but I believe it's one-third, were under 10 miles an hour speed restrictions. Um, in the early 1980s, the mean distance between failures on the subway in New York was about 6,000 miles, so maybe 10,000 kilometers. Um, if you do everything right, it should be in kilometers deep, uh, deep uh, six figures, um, and but and even deep, and even six figures in miles. Um, and uh, it, it, for example, um, after they got past that era of, uh, of New York in the 2010s, they uh, were hitting, I believe, a, a mean distance between failures of about 200,000 kilometers, so a little more than 100,000 miles. Um, so 200,000 kilometers is where you should be, 10,000 kilometers is a disaster. If you ride the subway, just as an ordinary commuter, let's say you're riding 10 kilometers um, uh, in each direction, uh, so that's twice a day, and if you ride every day including weekends, it means that you're uh, going to see a breakdown um, every year in a few months. Um, and, uh, and if you ride longer, you're going to see maybe a breakdown every year. Uh, and if you're on a line with older trains, you will see even more breakdowns. Um, when I say 200,000 today, it's a, an average. So the newer trains are much better. The newer trains might be 300,000 miles, so 400, 500,000 500, kilometers. And the older trains, like the R32s, are not as good. Um, I think it would be 50,000, 60,000. Um, so the point is that, especially if you knew that your line was getting the older trains, you would see a breakdown every few months. Um, that is not reliable. I can remember um, shift workers, zero tolerance, um, and, 
and and the and it was not unreliability for uh, from high speed. It was unreliability from a system that was already substantially under ten mile an hour um, speed limits. Um, so they realized something was wrong, and the and this is when and when they got Richard Ravitch to save the system in the early nineteen eighties. Um, among the things that they did is first of all a five year capital plan rather than not having a regular capital plan, and another thing was they said fix it first, state of good repair. Um, the this is I believe the provenance of the term fix it first in uh, American transportation advocacy. It's based on what New York did in the eighties and nineties. They said, okay, we don't have money for a second avenue subway. Yes, we started building it in the seventies. That is not our focus. Our focus is state of good repair. This was a smashing success. Um, remember, ten thousand kilometers between breakdowns in the early eighties and um, by the two thousands they're about two hundred thousand. Um, the system, the speed limits were lifted. The trains sped up, albeit never to the levels that they achieved before um, the problems of the 1970s. Um, the uh, certain connections are still slower than they were um, in the early or the middle of the 20th century. Um, but um, the and um, a lot of investments, for example, um, the signaling upgrades on the L CBTC. Um, which could be bundled with higher speed. In fact, they are in Paris. The automation increases the speed through more precise um, running. In New York, they decrease the speed because the uh, because they don't prioritize it. So, for example, they decide to slow down the um, acceleration and deceleration rates of the trains uh, in order to uh, save a little bit money, a little bit of money on brake wear. Um, so, uh, so they could run faster, but they don't. Um, and one of the things that Pfeiffer did was he prioritized the speed with saving precious seconds. Um, and uh, so, so you see, so the point is, people saw improvements in the eighties and nineties. This is really important. People must see tangible improvements coming out of government spending. The main way that you prevent every government program from becoming a slush fund for corrupt public officials is because you have a free press. Um, the free press can be politically a supporter of the party in power, but it is not going to be a bootlicker. Um, the free press can be neutral. The free press can hate the party in power and look for any possible scandal on it. Um, and, um, the, uh, and um, this needs to be, and moreover, people must be able to observe what is happening. When you build a subway line, if the subway line is not built, it is an embarrassment. When you uh, build, actually, so actually, uh, and, and a good example of this is the Berlin airport. Um, the Berlin airport, for people who are unfamiliar, um, the airport actually exists. Um, Berlin, bro. Yeah, it helps when I spell it correctly. Um, so this airport um, was originally planned to open in October of 2011. The Berlin-Brandenburg Airport opened for commercial traffic on 31 October 2020. So when you have nine year delay, so when you have an airport that was supposed to take five years to build and actually took 14 years with um, a massive cost overruns as well, this is an embarrassment. The people involved will have to answer to media inquiries. Um, and then because the government wants to be seen as not uh, coddling uh, incompetence or corruption, um, they might have to answer parliamentary inquiries. Um, this is a really valuable disciplining tool. Everyone in Germany knows that if they build a, ma a mega project like this, they're going to have to make sure it is not going to be the next Berlin Brandenburg airport um, because everyone will just um, flagellate them if the same thing happens again. Now, if you are an official and you know this, one way is to become more competent. Now, let's say you're an incompetent public official, you will find ways to spend money that are not going to lead to any embarrassment. So you will promise things that you can always wiggle 
yourself out of. This is why, for example, in New York City, people talk about affordable housing. Now, over here, when they talk about housing, they talk about housing production targets. They're saying, we will build this many housing units, or the, we will build this many subsidized housing units. In New York City, um, this is not the language used. Bill de Blasio, for example, was promising on affordable housing to build or preserve a certain number of housing units. You do not see the construction cranes. I mean, some people see construction cranes and, uh, and they immediately assume that there are luxury condos, A, because they often are, B, because every building that looks like it was built in the 2010s and not in the 1930s looks like a luxury condo, including um, um, some really embarrassing examples from an untaught where uh, things that looked like they were built in the 2010s and were excoriated as luxury condos turned out to be, uh, they turned out to be affordable housing, subsidized affordable housing. Um, but, um, but, people, but people can see that the new housing units are there. Um, especially if it's public housing, where you see it as public housing, it announces itself, NYC Housing Authority. Um, if it is preserved, what does preserve means? It means existing uh, rent-stabilized units that um, would otherwise revert to market, and you're going to do behind-the-scenes things to prevent them from reverting to market. Nobody sees this. Nobody's going to know. You can't even say we have X, you can't even say there's growth in rent stabilized units. All you're going to say is, well, otherwise we would have had even fewer rent stabilized units. The government can wiggle its way out of it. And therefore, um, they can always accuse the media of being scandal mongers. Uh, nowadays they say fake news um, whenever they are criticized. Um, and journalists um, will know that if they wish to get um, government sources, they will um, shut up. Uh, about what goes on. Um, the mo so when you say state of good repair, again, you're starting from something that worked. No, oh, that's not working anymore. This is what I was looking for. 50, when you say something like state of good repair, again, this is not a corrupt deal in any way, shape, or form. Um, this start. This is something that advocates like. And advocates do not like it because they themselves are corrupt. Advocates like it because they saw it work in New York, but that was 30 years ago. And just as everything that starts out okay suddenly gets shoehorned into American transportation failure, so American light rail is a lot more expensive than it was 20 or 30 years ago, um, and, you, and you have a lot of compromise, and suddenly things get compromised, um, as soon as, let's say, heavyweight politicians get in, when they hear it's a the next big thing is to build um, uh, three kilometers of bus lanes. Um, in the same way, state of good repair became part of the rot. Um, and Amtrak, Amtrak during the Bush administration was under pressure to look profitable for privatization. And they did what you always do when you're under such pressure, not just in the public sector, private railroads such as the Milwaukee Railroad did the same. The Milwaukee Railroad ended up crashing and burning in the 1970s um, when it just could not afford to um, clear the backlog of deferred maintenance. Um, so Amtrak had a leader named David Gunn, who I recently, who I just maybe two hours ago said something negative about on Twitter, about something completely different. But even then I made it clear, David Gunn's effect on American public transportation has been positive. His effect on Amtrak was positive. Um, and he was a fix-it-first type of person, and what he did was he knew that anything big would attract too much political attention and compromise, so instead of saying, oh, we're doing a, a high-speed rail back when 110 miles an hour was considered high-speed rail between Philadelphia and Harrisburg, instead said, well, we're doing some upgrades, I need just a little bit, and this is how a lot of Keystone Carter improvements happened, um, by, not, uh, by not treating it as a mega project. Um, and anyway, among his beliefs was that uh, you cannot make intercity passenger rail profitable. He's incorrect, but this is what he believed. He believed that Amtrak uh, is like the national park system, a national treasure, um, and he refused to make Amtrak profitable. Um, and what he refused to do specifically was maintenance deferral. Uh, he even argued about this publicly in committee with John McCain. He uh, told John McCain, well, what about the commuter airlines of Arizona? Um, 
in reward for his success, uh, Gan was removed by the Amtrak board, run by political appointees of the Bush administration, and replaced with a much more pliable leader who then deferred maintenance, as he was told. The same leader uh, stayed on um, as the administration transitioned from Bush to Obama. Um, in 2009, there was no longer a climate of uh, austerity and uh, cuts. The climate in 2009 was a big stimulus bill at the um, then unheard of level of about $800 billion. People at the time were starting to learn about the success of high-speed rail in Europe because, I mean, starting in the 80s with the big pushes were in the 90s and early 2000s and, then, and that's roughly when America, so in the 2000s is when Americans learned that there's th this amazing technology in Europe and in Japan. Um, you had, uh, I forget whether Obama himself said that he envies um, European high-speed rail, um, but Ray LaHood said that he envies um, the better uh, high-speed rail networks that you have abroad. I think by, uh, by, by the early 2010s he was even mentioning China uh, positively. Um, he also said that, I mean, it's bad that China is authoritarian, but he said that, uh, but he praised China's infrastructure. So this was known at the time, so people were discussing high-speed rail. Um, the map, so the, the capital M map uh, by Alfred Tu, um, um, is not a recent thing. The, ha the high-speed rail, I think the first version of it is from 2013. Yeah. 2000, February 2013. So this is kind of people who were fantasizing after um, the Obama administration failed to build significant high-speed rail in America. Um, so my point is that in 2009, there was a climate, a political climate, not of austerity, but of plenty when it came to government investment. So what does Amtrak do? Amtrak does not say, okay, for 10 billion or 15 billion, you will build high-speed rail on the Northeast corridor. They're too incompetent to do so. Instead, they say, we need $10 billion for a state of good repair. The same people who under-maintained the tracks a few years before suddenly cried poverty when money became available. This is the sort of behavior that you encourage when you spend two-thirds, almost, of your mass transit, and, and it's not really two-thirds because you should really add the zero emissions buses, so maybe it's one-half. When you spend one-half of your transit bucket on state of good repair, this is what happens. You, get, um, you give license to public, to public sector agencies to demand money um, without having anything to show for it. If anything, it encourages them to under-maintain. Uh, and, and if this money is given, here's what's going to happen. It's going to be spent, and then it's going to run out because there's not going to be any cost control. And then, starting in maybe 2023, 2024, there's going to be... Um, the, um, there's going to be a lot of under maintenance that nobody's going to talk about, and then in, two, in the early 2030s they will say, "Oh, we have such a huge backlog. Give us not 55 billion, give us 200 billion for state of good repair." This is what's going to happen. Um, so I said that the 25 bill for uh, uh, the 25 bill for um, zero emissions buses should be spent not purely on BEBs, or maybe even not mostly on BEBs, but on IMC. Um, the 85 that is tagged as mass transit, the 5 for ADA is good. The one thing that I would add is that they um, are going to find ways to coerce New York City to stop leaking the money, um, by which I mean spending ADA money on things that are not ADA. Um, this is a big problem in New York. Um, but um, So beyond tighter control of whatever the MTA is doing, um, this is good, the 5. Um, the 25, I imagine, is good, um, but the 55 should go here. So instead of 55 state of good repair, 25 expansion, this should be zero state of good repair, um, and 80 expansion, and they should probably also require agencies to uh, staff up their in-house design in advance. Um, you do not want to do something called early commitment. Um, early commitment or premature commitment, this is something that uh, you do when the political system declares we will build Project X. Um, I guess Project X might also sound like the name of something secretive. No, I mean Project X is a generic thing. We will build the Berlin-Brandenburg airport. We will build the high-speed line from the Belgian border to Amsterdam. We will build 
Second Avenue Subway. We will build East Side Access. We will build the Gateway Tunnel, um, which is uh, going to be a lot of the way here. They're talking about uh, nearly half. This is 39 to modernization of the Northeast Corridor. This is mostly just going to be, be most of that's just going to get wasted on, gateway on the Gateway Tunnel. Um, when you declare this must be built at all costs, it, you're effectively giving license to every single group to um, uh, dip its uh, um, to dip its beak. Um, this was an enormous problem in the Netherlands, and they're um, engaging in mechanisms to prevent that. For example, requiring projects to be in a more advanced uh, stage of design before the this, before the political commitment is made. And the problem is with Gateway, the political commitment was made long ago. Um, the, uh, es essentially, as soon as ARC got cancelled, Amtrak immediately stepped in. They didn't say, let's think about it. They immediately said, this must be done. This is the first step of high-speed rail. They did not say costs and benefits. They never portrayed it as something that might not be built. They portrayed it as essential. This is a political problem that leads to cost overruns. Now, again, when you say 80 billion fund, so the 25 from expansion and the 55 that is a state of good repair that should be expansion, that's fine. When you say our budget is 80, you, the agencies, must come up with some designs. They don't have to be finalized, but they have to be more advanced than the 1% designs that you uh, do in-house before applying for FTA funds. And only with, then with the funds do you hire designers for um, more um, advanced refinement? No. The, and the transit agencies must... Um, the transit agencies must have a larger in-house team. This means that they need to stop relying on these cycles of state austerity and then hogging um, stimulus. This means that they need to also be more prudent internally um, and they need to sometimes be able to say no to people and these people might include the governor. They certainly include every community group that thinks it uh, is owed um, community betterment projects. Um, and they need to have enough capacity for in-house design to constantly have these designs. And if the federal government says we will fund this, they can have a design and send this to the federal government. They should not send premature things to the FTA, because again, that, that gets to the prior to the prim, to the not prior um, early commitment problem. Um, and when you have early commitment, again, the, I mean, even in the Netherlands, the Netherlands is not a high corruption country. Okay, the Netherlands is not. I don't know, Italy. Italy is a, very, is a high corruption country, but it's also very low cost because they specifically crack down on the corruption that led to high construction costs. So when it comes to public infrastructure, Italy is actually an incredibly clean country right now. But in general, there is political corruption in Italy, much more so than in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is not a high political corruption country. It's just a country where the incentives um, are misplaced and therefore costs um, are possibly the highest in continental Western Europe. Um, I never remember the cost of the um, of H uh, of HSL site, um, and I apologize in advance for how I'm butchering off the the Dutch language. Um, okay, they're not telling me how much this cost. Um, my recollection is that in today's money, it's uh, oh, oh, and it was also PPP, um, which tends to increase costs. But, um, okay, I'm going to actually check this because um, because we are going to need to also do a database on... Okay, so they're saying 6.7 billion euros. Um, okay, so 6.7 billion euros. This is the line that's 125 kilometers. Um, okay, at 2006... Okay, so I don't really like railwaytechnology.com. Okay. Okay, Railway Gazette is saying 6.5, um, and Railway Gazette tends to be reliable on these things. Um, and if they're saying, these are no, these numbers are all, are all pretty similar, so, so I'm just going to say 6.5 and let's say 2,000, and, uh, I don't know, 2,000 euros or something. So the point is that 6.5 bill, so this is 52 million euros a year, not even in today's euros, these are the euros of 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and we do have inflation in Europe. Our inflation rate is not literally zero. Our inflation rate is incredibly low, but it is not literally zero. So this is what happens. Um, um, and, and this is what happens when 
um, you build things improperly. This, um, so they had the, so they had the early commitment problems throughout the 2000s. This was a report from I believe 2008 or 2009, which was kind of a lesson learned. Um, partly from this, partly from uh, par um, partly from the North South Line in Amsterdam, which is also one of the most expensive lines in uh, in Europe. Um, okay, this is merged costs, um, which is not the, uh, so our live file is actually called merge costs. 1.3 because um, a, a, a few more things, but uh, but this is the Netherlands um, where which it didn't touch. Um, North South Line, not fully underground. 3.1 billion euros, 10 kilometers. In dollars, it's about in, in the dollars of 10 years ago, um, it's 400. Um, now these co now if you're American you might think these costs oh 400 is great especially in a city as difficult to build as Amsterdam so so dense uh, so old these are 17th century buildings uh, so expensive um, uh, the soil is horrific um, it's a, a it's alluvial soil the hardest to build in Shanghai which is uh, I, I mean the, the Netherlands of China is um, the Jiangnan region so that's roughly Shanghai. Um, and that also has the highest construction costs. And yes, Shanghai is rich, but Shenzhen is rich, Beijing is rich, Shanghai costs more to build in. Um, and you say, oh, even with this, it's 400 million per kilometer. I mean, I guess maybe 500 million in today's money. 500 million per kilometer might sound okay if you're American, but we're not American. We're European. We're not used to 500. Um, we're you, um, in, so in Paris, the, with the latest cost overruns on Grand Paris Express, um, it's um, slightly more underground than north south, and it is still south of three hundred. And um, even pro transit activists keep asking for the cancellation of the least useful parts of GP of GPE. It's uh, because because of the construction cost overruns. Likewise, in uh, like likewise where I live. Um, so these are all old lines. So the most recent one is this. And because of the high construction costs, people saying, oh, well, maybe we should build streetcars and not subways. <coughs> so these costs um, that, that come from early commitment and such are not normal. They're elevated relative to the social milieu, to, to, the, to, to, the, uh, to the general area where it is built. And this is why in the Netherlands, they are trying to do something better. And my point is that the stimulus is repeating these problems. These problems that made HSL site, again, apologies for my pronunciation, that line, in today's money, I'm guessing it would be something like maybe 80 something million dollars per kilometer. Um, now I do want to, uh, this does include um, a short tunnel, but it's a short tunnel and I do want to point out that this is 60 billion for the Northeast Corridor, where you do not have to tunnel as much, and you do not have to tunnel as much in the alluvial soil of Holland. Um, so if Amtrak were only as incompetent as the Dutch government, um, it would cost 50 or 60 billion to build the high-speed rail in the Northeast Corridor. Um, and, uh, and it's actually hard to be as bad as um, the Dutch government. It's a, everyone thinks that the Netherlands is very competent, which it is in certain things, but its public sector has problems. Um, and my point is that they're being reproduced in the United States. If, if anything, maybe they're around. The United States has been doing this for a lot longer and for a lot worse than the Netherlands. Um, and when you're saying this must be built, um, when you when the F, when the FDA grants money for a project that is barely in design that has been rushed in the design just so that they can get it to the grand phase because they don't have any internal money for their own capital planning, um, that's going to get you problems. Um, now, I do not. Now, I was asked by a journalist I'm not going to name, not out of secrecy, just because I do not know if it will appear in the article what I said. I do not know. So, so here's what I said. Um, I said to this journalist. Um, that um, I do not know in legislative language how to demand cost control. I do know in legislative language that you should move this 55, um, so you should move this 55 to bolster this. 
This, I can tell you, this is in legislative language. Instead of 55 billion for SOGR and 25 for expansion, you spend 80 on expansion, and maybe you put a note saying that um, maintenance is always going to be in operations. These are always going to be the responsibility uh, of um, local and state agencies. The federal government will fund exp investment in expansion, not ongoing uh, costs. Um, and um, the um, and likewise with railways, I can maybe say, well, 39, they're saying nearly half of 80, that means, it, I know the actual numbers, they're just not being, they're just not printing it, it's 39. Well, 39 on the NEC got to full high-speed rail and some more. Um, but, but, but that's a separate question that I can get into the next week. Um, and, the, and the point is, I do not know in legislative language how to say there must be in-house planning we will, the FTA is not going to fund projects that are going to have the insane costs of a rushed project like the Green Line extension, a light rail line that cost $2 billion um, with, um, for about 7 kilometers of trenched light rail. This makes it slightly more expensive than the global median for a subway. It is not a subway, it is light rail in a trench. Um, and they didn't dig the trench. The trench existed. They needed to widen it at a few places, but open air trench. Um, they're gonna. They need to say, "We will not do this again. Do not rush." Um, and um, th and and this means they um, they do need to demand tangible improvements. Tangible improvements don't have to happen tomorrow. They can happen in five years. They can happen in maybe ten years. People think that it takes longer to build infrastructure than it actually does. Um, but um, but it does need to, um, but, but there does need to be improvement that people can point to and say, thanks to stimulus money, this was built. Thanks to stimulus money, my train is faster. Thanks to stimulus money, um, my train is no longer so delayed. Thanks to stimulus money, um, my trains are less crowded because they come more often. This is something that people need to be able to see because you can fail. If you can't fail, you can't succeed. If you put yourself in a position that everything can say, well, we staved off unemployment, this is something that Obama did, he never compared, he never took credit for actual unemployment rates because they were really terrible. He, he compared unemployment rates with, um, he, compared unemployment rate, uh, he compared unemployment rates with hypothetical unemployment rates and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and never went beyond that. And um, so, so th th it cannot be like this. It has to be something concrete that people can see. And yes, there will be failures. You want to keep the proportion of projects that um, are bad enough that they're going to be discussed on Fox News to a reasonable minimum. It will never be zero. Deal with it. I mean, people, uh, I mean, people will say, uh, you want to be in a position where people can say, yes, the thing we funded and say, California sucked, but look at the things we're funding in New York, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in Texas. You want to have actual observable successes, and this 55 billion is the opposite. And again, I'm hopping on it because it's something that I can tell in legislative language what to do and what not to do. Do not do this. Do this and this. I mean, I mean again, with, I mean, ADA to me is expansion. Um, so this is my take on the, on the Biden infrastructure plan, at least the parts of it that I understand best, which are um, transportation, especially public transportation. Um, so, um, yeah, okay, so you're talking about, um, um, so you're talking about minimum readiness, um, readiness requirement, uh, yeah. Um, but again, I don't know how to say it in a DC policy language, in a DC policy staffer language, or in congressional staffer language, like what do exactly require. Um, I can say things like, oh, the FTA needs to have more people reviewing projects for cost. Um, one of the problems was when uh, the Obama administration uh, got rid of the cost effectiveness ratings. The cost effectiveness ratings were unpopular among advocates because the numbers, um, it's, not, it's not because they didn't like the idea of metrics, it's because the metrics gave the wrong answers. Um, they kind of overrated um, suburban commuters because the metrics, be, be kind of like because, kind of the, the things that were most visible to the cost effectiveness index in the 2000s 
uh, so what was most visible to it uh, was uh, rush hour commuters, um, especially ones going longer distances. Um, so um, things that so the so people roughly under, so, so people vaguely understood that you needed more urban transit, but because the C but because the I didn't really understand that, they decided to get rid of it entirely, and then the FDA would just say yes to everything. Um, but I do want to caution that costs were high even beforehand for subways. Costs in America have been getting worse decade after decade, um, and the political reform proposals tend to always make things worse. Um, and uh, so the abolition of CI was um, one such problem. Um, so they need to restore CI or do a better CI rather, and have the, and have an FDA that can actually tell people now. Like it's really important to be able to tell people now. Um, and I don't know how to express that in the legislative language. I don't know how to express readiness, unfortunately, in the legislative language. Um, but it is a thing. Um, so this is definitely getting uploaded. Um, so thanks to the bunch of you who have been sticking around and watching me live. Um, and if there are questions, you can put them in chat and I will answer. Um, but I can't spend another hour and a half in doing so the way I did last week, so... Oh, by the way, Robert, you're saying uh, ha says Zaud. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know how the letters are pronounced in, in, in Dutch. It's just that the, um, the word for south is... Uh, um, so in the Netherlands, um, like the, it, it's something weird with the great vowel shift. So like in English now, when you have um, the, uh, a long I, it's not pronounced like the, you'd expect the letter I pronounced like E, it's pronounced well, I. Um, and something similar happened in German and Dutch, and um, because of weird issues with umlaut, but, um, long story short, in the Netherlands, um, they have this weird vowel, in Dutch they have this weird vowel, which is spelled U-I, which is pronounced something like I, or I, I've, I I'm gonna, I, I'm butchering it, because it doesn't exist in any language that I speak. Um, but but it is but that's the vowel in South. It's not like Sart. It's not like Zart or Sart. Um. So so again, this is, so so again, I, I know that I'm mangling the Dutch language, and I'm really sorry. Thankfully, um, very few people are monolingual in Dutch. Oh, link to YouTube channel. Um. I have a bunch of different YouTube, uh, a bunch of different Google accounts. Um, I will let, so um, I will link on Twitter when um, when I upload this because again I have not uploaded any of these so far because um, two year because not weird two, two weeks ago the stream was kind of wonky. I can upload it, but it's not going to be very good. Um, and a week ago it was better, but it was interminable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dutch don't mind. I mean, the, I mean, they'll um, switch. But I mean, even Berlin is a little bit like that. I mean, so Berlin is not as uniformly anglophone as Amsterdam. Amsterdam, Amsterdam is the biggest um, fully anglophone city in the um, European Union because it's bigger than Stockholm and, and Copenhagen. But um, uh, but Berlin is the bar is the biggest mostly anglophone EU city. Um, but, but, and yeah, it's, it's a thing in Berlin, like it's a, um, I want to say it's a drag on my ability to learn the German language, or the actual, my actual drag on learning the German language is that, um, um, essentially all the spaces, yeah, yes, it, Dublin counts, Dublin is a smaller city than, um, Amsterdam, I think it's also smaller than Stockholm. Um, I think Dublin is like 1.5, 1.7 million metro, and, um, Stockholm is 2.5, Copenhagen probably about the same. Is what article? Oh, in German? No, 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 no. The um, so actually the grammatical gender part of like the the grammar of German is not the problem. Um, so in, so so the thing is when I write German I can look it up. When I read German it's incorrect grammar. When I speak German, um, the um, in spoken German you never make all of the distinctions. So this is why English actually lost all of its um, all of these inflections. This is why English lost grammatical gender. Um, so in Germanic languages, the intonation is such that you, it's very easy to um, skip over like a final vowel, like the O versus A of, uh, of Romance languages, 
um, or, the, or the us versus um versus whatever, like in Latin cases. So that happened, so um, because English was only a spoken language um, between about, um, let's say, the Norman Conquest, maybe 1200, um, and also English had already start, been, been starting to lose these endings, so just lost all of these endings. Um, and this has also been happening in Dutch and in um, Swedish and in Danish and in Norwegian, but in, the, in, in German, it's happening in spoken German, um, but written German is kind of, but written German is its own thing. Um, but, but when you speak German, I mean, it does, I mean, you, you say duh, I mean, it, it, you, you say duh, I mean, it doesn't matter if you remember whether it's D or duh, and you also remember it after the um, first or second time. Um, no, the, the problem is, the, the problem is always just speaking at normal pace. Um, and um, it, it's also a problem in French. Um, French is spoken incredibly quickly, so you need to actually be able to keep up. The problem is never the grammar. Um, Um, the, no, the bigger problem is also that um, I socialize in very immigrant-heavy spaces, so I, so I socialize in spaces where people speak better English than German anyway. Um, um, and, and, this, and the mostly German spaces I go to are very difficult, not because of language, but because um, if you're German, then you think that it is okay to talk about, the, about, about how um, Immigrant integration is a problem in the in this country, and this is, includes even very left-wing spaces, um, where you talk about how diverse neighborhoods are very dangerous. And people, I mean, I think most New Yorkers understand that if you say Harlem is sketchy, um, then first of all it's bullshit, and second of all it's racist bullshit. Um, but unfortunately, people in um, Berlin will say those things about, for example, Neukölln or Kreuzberg. Um, neighborhoods where I must add, if you get robbed in Kreuzberg, the only thing that it will, the, the only reason you might get robbed in Kreuzberg is because you went into Biomarkt and paid organic food prices. That's the only robbery in Kreuzberg. Um, are there other questions? Um, I don't want to stay up until it gets dark ranting about German racism. Um, I'm gonna give it, I always like giving it one more minute because I know that there's a little bit of a lag with OBS and, um, and with Dredge, so, uh, so, I wanna be in, so I don't wanna be in a position in which someone asks and then immediately shut down. Um, but, but, I, but anyway, like this is my main take on the infrastructure plan. I mean, the cost, I mean, there are, it's written in a way that is going to make the cost problem worse and I do not, oh, I talked about high-speed rail other than California. Where is the worst? Northeast Carter is a lot worse than California. I mean, the, I mean, California California has these horrific alignments. So for people who are uninitiated, um, there are uh, two big alignment questions for Los Angeles to San Francisco. The first is how are you getting between LA and Bakersfield? Uh, now, if you're now, if you're an ordinary mortal, you might think, okay, you tunnel a little bit around the mountains and you go like this, along roughly I-5 LA to Bakersfield, but um, you maybe fail to see the galaxy brain of what they're actually planning to do, which is, I'm going to draw it as a, path, as a very rough path, which is like Burbank. They want to go through Santa Clarita and then up here, but they decided to randomly tunnel through this mountain because they figured if they need tunnels anyway, might as well. Through Palmdale, through here, and then through another tunnel. And then more tunnels. So this has more tunnels than the direct route. It's also much longer than the direct route. However, it's going to develop Palmdale, which is about the only place even vaguely commutable to Los Angeles where you can build housing without getting stoned. So, And, when, and to just make it very clear, when I say stoned, I don't mean the 420 kind. Um, so that's the first alignment problem. The second alignment problem is less stark on a map. It's are you getting from the Central Valley to the Bay Area via Pacheco Pass, which is this line, which is this road. Um, and then you enter San Jose from the south and then up a commuter line with share tracks for 80 kilometers. Or do you keep going in the Central Valley and then you use the I-80 route and then you dip through um, not 80 but 50 something kilometers of track sharing? and the suburbs. 
and this returns out to be better. It's, again, it's, it's less stark. It, like the only, the only obvious thing on a map is that when you build it this way, you basically have a second runner for free. Whereas if you build up, to, up until here, it's a longer, uh, um, it, it's a longer road to Sacramento. Then you can also forget about doing San Francisco to Sacramento on the same line because this is plausible, whereas this isn't. Um, but even with the terrible alignment choices, they're talking about I want to say eighty billion for the whole thing, which is more expensive than the Netherlands. Um, so they're slightly more incompetent than. Um, the Netherlands, maybe, maybe a bit more incompetent because the soil in California is bad, but it's less bad than the Netherlands. Um, but in the Northeast Corridor, they're not talking, I mean, remember the Northeast Corridor at Dutch coasts, at literal Dutch coasts, even though they need less tunneling, it's 60, and they think it's going to be 150. And at this point, they're talking about 300, so now the Northeast Corridor is actually the worst. Amtrak is the worst. Um, um, is that the extent of details in the Biden plan? As far as I know, uh, I have no inside knowledge. Um, I have never met Buttigieg. I have never spoken to Buttigieg. Um, I have never zoomed with Buttigieg. I have never met or zoomed with anyone who was even claiming to have access to Buttigieg. I imagine that I have met people that have talked to him because I know that he did a lot of podcasts um, and, he, uh, and, and met a lot of uh, policy nerds uh, in the primary campaign. So. I imagine he met Matt Iglesias. I imagine he met John Lovett. Lovett, Lovett. Um, 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 or, or at least spoke to them. Uh, and, but they never said, oh, this is what I heard from Secretary Pete. Um, maybe they posed hypothetical questions like for the, pub, uh, for the public, but I do not have any inside information. I'm just relying on things that I'm seeing. And, and you saw that I had to Google because I'm basing this on things that I see on Twitter, and Twitter is terrible for retrievability um, because you never because you see it in retweets, so you never remember from which account you saw it. Um, yeah, six degrees, six degrees of Pete Buttigieg, um, and um, so, so again, I don't know what they're gonna do. I, I can tell you what I hope they're going to do. Um, I know that there are people reading me who are who have some policy influence, but they don't know how much they have. Again, nobody has ever come to me publicly or privately and said, Alon, I have an, I have an in with um, the secretary. Um, if you have a five minute blurb about what to do, he will listen. Um, so again, the, the details that I shared are everything that, that I know. It's just this allocation. Um, and as you notice, I, can, I need to make assumptions about what, for example, uh, zero emissions vehicles uh, means. Um, but, but it's an intelligent assumption. I'm not making a blind guess that the 25 bill is intended to go to BEBs and not trolleybuses or IMC. Um, yeah, it, it, it's actually a very reasonable thing. I imagine it's going to change. I imagine that um, uh, there's going to be some uh, congressional changes. Um, again, I do, but I also don't know what the changes are. I know that um, Senator Manchin um, was writing somewhat critical things uh, about, um, about the plan. Um, so I imagine he will want some changes. Uh, I do not have any idea what changes he would want. Um, people keep joking about um, pork to uh, West Virginia. I don't think he's motivated by pork. Um, he doesn't seem very motivated by earmarks and such. He's motivated by procedural moderation. Um, are there any other questions? I'm going to try to be done by 8, and you can see that it's almost 8. I will, however, say uh, uh, I will, however, say that I think that the um, numbers that they have released are probably things that they do not expect to be too controversial. Like I don't think that they expect there to be political controversy over state of good repair versus expansion. I imagine that's something that was put there by staffers who heard activists who were thinking about the New York City success of the '80s and '90s, or maybe about the. Um, renovations done in Chicago in the same period that also that um, unlike in New York they reduced operating expenses Chicago has rather low operating expenses on the L um, 
well in line with global norms. It might even be slightly below first world average, I'm not sure. Technically, it's five dollars per car kilometer, but the, the cars in Chicago are small, but I mean, the cars in Berlin are also small. Um, sure, um, thanks for watching. Um, as I said, I will definitely want to upload this. Um, and uh, now we're gonna face the really exciting game of can YouTube handle a multi-gig file? But um, if not, I mean, you're, you are privileged to see it, but, but I imagine again, I imagine this is going to get uploaded. Um, so thanks for watching, and I will, as usual, I will see you guys. And uh, just as a reminder uh, to people who are going to maybe watch this on YouTube, I stream every Saturday at 6 in the evening my time. My time is Berlin. So if you are, so, so I'm at, most of my viewers um, are from the United States, often from usually the Eastern United States. Um, so usually I'm six hours ahead of you. The difference is that um, such isn't the boundaries between daylight savings, so what we call summertime and wintertime, the, it might sometimes be misaligned. Um, normally, um, if you're from the Eastern United States, it's noon. If you're in uh, the Central European time zone, it's always six in the evening, 1800, uh, and on Saturdays. So thank you and um, uh, see you later.